Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, uh, dear uh, colleagues. Uh, welcome to the second edition of the IES Big Ideas uh, Lecture. Some of you uh, may remember uh, that uh, in November we had uh, the honor of hosting Mrs. Mary Robinson, former President of Ireland and the Special Envoy of Mr. Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General on uh, Climate. And uh, we are honored that today we have a, another distinguished guest, uh, Sir David King. We are delighted to see so many of our uh, colleagues around the table and many governments who were very engaged in the COP meeting in Paris the month of December. In the Paris meeting, we had a historical achievement. More than 190 countries signed an uh, agreement in which they commit themselves to address the issue of climate change. And this is, of course, a great news for all of us. And energy sector is at the heart of it. Two thirds of the emissions causing climate change come from the energy sector. So there is a lot of work for us uh, to do. And as such, this very lecture of uh, Sir David King is very important uh, for the uh, IEA. What are the next steps? What are the uh, key milestones in front of us? And we couldn't find anybody who is better than Sir David King to talk us uh, through these uh, issues. Uh, Professor uh, Sir David King is the UK Foreign Secretary Special Representative for Climate Change. He was very kind uh, to find time during the COP meeting, even participating to a few IEA events. Uh, many thanks uh, for that, uh, uh, Sir uh, David. And I mentioned that a major uh, the outcome, of course, the Paris meeting was the agreement of 190 countries, but there was a, another very important outcome, which was the so-called Mission Innovation Project, in which more than 20 countries and also several private sector <coughs> participants, led by Bill Gates and many other billionaires, committed themselves to increase the research and development in energy in order to accelerate the innovation. It's a crucial uh, outcome. And uh, Sir David played a critical role in that outcome, uh, not only by uh, his uh, project, the Apollo project, I'm sure he's going to tell you about uh, that. Apollo project was uh, one of the cornerstones of uh, that uh, mission innovation, which once again, I consider as one of the main outcomes of the uh, uh, COP21 meeting. A few words about uh, Sir David, and I will leave the floor uh, to uh, him. Sir David is a, a physical chemist uh, by training. He served as the UK government's chief scientific advisor from 2000 to 2007, working with Prime Ministers uh, Blair and uh, Brown to raise awareness uh, of the need to act on uh, climate change. And he was instrumental in the creation of the Energy Technologies Institute, as well as the uh, Smith School of Enterprise and Environment at uh, Oxford. He has held professorships in many prestigious universities 
received 23 honorary degrees. He was knighted in 2003 and received the Legion of Honor from the French government in 2009. Among those, among over and beyond those uh, very impressive uh, achievements in his career, Sir David King is uh, a very committed uh, person who really finds a solution to climate change as soon as possible and bringing all the countries on board. He had tireless efforts through Paris, towards Paris, during the negotiations, day and night, I know myself. And now it is very important for us, it's a great privilege for us, uh, Sir David, to hear what is the direction of travel after uh, Paris. Uh, Sir David, once again, thank you very much for coming to IEA and to share your views with our ambassadors, uh, with the uh, colleagues from the IEA, OECD, and beyond. Once again, thank you very much and welcome to IEA. Executive Director Birol, colleagues, um, it's, it's a great honor to be here. And um, I want to thank you, first of all, for your overly kind words. I'm very grateful for them. What, what we are dealing with today is a looming catastrophe for mankind. And I believe that it's quite possible that future historians will say that the 12th of December 2015 was a critically important turning point for all of us. Now, everything depends on delivery after Paris, uh, and so that really will be the focus of what I have to say. Let me just uh, take you through the Paris Agreement itself, and I'll deal with this fairly quickly because what I want to do is talk about the consequences and leave us for enough time for a, a Q&A session. So first of all, uh, this is a very simplified version of a lengthy document. So let me just say, first of all, the most important thing was that the process that was decided at Kyoto failed in Copenhagen, and the failure was a process that we had to learn from and after that, the meeting in Durban was the beginning of a new way forward that was delivered in Paris. And, and the difference is essentially described as follows. Kyoto was intended as a top-down process in which governments would agree to, to a decision which would then be imposed on all governments through this United Nations process. And in particular, it was built around the developed countries doing a lot and the developing countries simply doing very little. Now, since Kyoto, two things have happened. One, the failure of Copenhagen, which meant that a top-down process was never going to work, and we had to deliver an, a bottom-up. Um, but, but the second was really the realization that climate change was a looming catastrophe, and that action was, uh, was needed and needed quickly. In order to do a bottom-up process, uh, we determined on these nationally determined contributions. So by the time we arrived in Paris, we had 187 nations already making their nationally determined contributions clear, their intended nationally determined contributions. And so you could say the agreement was reached before we arrived into Paris, but that was by no means the only element of the agreement. And I'm going to simply say that this collection of nations, it's now about 190 that have made their nationally determined contributions, corresponding to more than 96% of global greenhouse gas emissions. This collection of nations making this agreement is not matched by anything that has happened historically before. So this is a, a major turning point. It is coupled, and the title of my talk describes this as a decarbonization process. The G7 heads of government in June last year in, in Germany uh, said that they were committed to decarbonize the global economy during the course of this century. That's a precise quote of their commitment. 
And in Paris, that was underlined by all nations in Paris, that we will decarbonize our economy during the course of this century. And perhaps amongst the many critically important speeches that were made, I want to draw attention to the speech by Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, uh, a highly responsible individual. And Mark Carney's speech was related to the avoidance of creating stranded assets in companies by continuing to only survive through fossil fuels. The companies themselves would become stranded, he pointed out, but also in countries. So Mark Carney was actually saying, if I can put it crudely, smell the coffee, see the direction of travel. We are shifting into a new world of decarbonizing. Now, let's take a look at these agreements that I've set out here. First of all, long-term goal. After much discussion, it was agreed that keeping the temperatures below 2 degrees centigrade wasn't enough, and you'll see that the agreement says we will pursue efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade. If we want to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, it would be good if we could aim towards a 1.5 degree centigrade world. I'm going to come back and comment on that in a moment. In order to achieve that, we move to the second part of the agreement. To achieve this, greenhouse gas emissions should peak as soon as possible, and then we must reach a balance between emissions and sinks in the second half of this century. We need to create more sinks to do this, not just reduce emissions, we need major programs of reforestation. And then we need a review mechanism. Every five years, we need to see how well or badly we are doing and then reanalyze what we ought to be doing to achieve the objectives. Finance it was agreed that there will be at least $100 billion a year after 2020 which would be essentially funds moving from the developed world to the developing world. Um, and after much discussion, it was added, this will also be reviewed uh, uh, in 2025. Differentiation was a big subject of discussion, keeping that distinction between developed and developing countries. Um, and since 1992, when this distinction was first made, of course, we all recognize that Countries like China, Brazil, South Africa, Mexico can no longer truly be described as sitting in the developing world group because we have these new emerging powers. And so differentiation is a difficult topic, but we managed to get some language around it and loss and damage as well. But I, I must say that the loss and damage is not an insurance policy against any climate-related loss and damage, but nevertheless, the wording was fairly carefully chosen. I want to stress, and uh, Fatih Birol has already referred to some of these, the, the importance of agreements that take place outside the uh, negotiations of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. I've just drawn out three of them here, uh, and these are three that I've been directly involved with. First of all, New York Forest Declaration, this was a declaration drawn up at the United Nations Secretary General's meeting in New York on the 23rd of September when he called on heads of government to come and make declarations about climate change. And Britain, Norway, and Germany had drawn up this forest declaration in an attempt to increase carbon sinks so that we can achieve our objectives. And that declaration essentially says that after 2030, there will no, be no further deforestation occurring anywhere in the world of natural forests. But also, and importantly, we will already have reforested an area the size of India by 2030. Now, that is, I believe, a realistic objective, and it's become more realistic because both in New York and in the subsequent meeting um, in Peru, in Lima, uh, we got nations that are forested signing up, we have 37 of the most forested nations now signed up to that declaration. And Britain, Norway, and Germany are already spending significant sums of money, billions of dollars, uh, backing up that process. Expansion of carbon pricing activities around the world. 
We've moved on from the Kyoto process. This is now entirely bottom up, where countries take ownership of their own processes of decarbonizing, and we're seeing very big new markets arising. Of course, we've got the European Union market, which is going to be in a good state by 2020, um, and we've also got the Chinese market coming through. Um, what we will have is a countrywide cap-and-trade process in China by 2017. I've just come back from Beijing, and it may be of interest that uh, the Chinese government is interested in talking to the European <laughs> Union about some way of shifting towards a united cap-and-trade process between EU and China, which is clearly an objective that, uh, that is needed in order to avoid multiple prices of carbon dioxide emerging. And there are many other parts of the world, California, Quebec, etc., that are moving on cap and trade. Eventually, we may find that we achieve a single global market. And then I'm going to add UK-USA agreement on Energy Africa and Power Africa was made in Paris. The two governments signed this agreement. It's a profound agreement. We're saying we will roll out to all villages in Africa that are currently off-grid, we will roll out renewable energy with batteries with microgrids to all of those villages, 620 million people <coughs> by 2030, using our aid budgets to oil the wheels of the process and entirely at the invitation of governments from Africa. Now, I, I see that as critically important not only in raising the standard of living of those people that are currently off-grid, but also if I tell you that the cost of achieving this through localized energy sources is probably three times less than extending the grid to all of those villages. So having access to renewable energy at a cheap rate, which it is now, allows us to carry this through in a way that is economic as well as dealing with the human well-being issue and reducing emissions of carbon dioxide. Human well-being de being delivered because at the moment People are burning kerosene inside houses, and that is shortening the lives of people in, in those parts of the world. <coughs> but I want to draw attention to another factor, and I see this as the important factor that I want to get across in this meeting. We have a, a new, enormous market in renewable energy, smart grids, energy storage facilities around the whole world represented by the sum of the nationally determined contributions. We can talk in a moment about whether or not those contributions will reach the objective of well below two degrees centigrade temperature rise, but for the moment, please bear in mind, this new surge in market activity is going to pull a large number of players into that marketplace. <coughs> we are talking about the world's biggest market. It, it puts laptops into uh, the shade. This market is going to be by 2022 to three trillion dollars a year. Now, the attraction of this process is going to be more competition, more technology being driven through, and we're going to see prices falling, and therefore the uptake accelerating. I think, in other words, we might have created a self-accelerating process that will proceed faster than countries had anticipated when they put in their nationally determined contributions. And the agreement we've made over Africa, rolling out renewable energy there, simply adds to the magnitude of that new market. Now, le let me address this question of our chances of staying close to the 1.5 degree target that, uh, that was agreed on as a result of the pressure from the small island states. <coughs> Britain may not be a small island state, but we are an island state. And we do suffer from the same problem. Rising sea levels, our, our country gets smaller. <coughs> so we, we have some sympathy with those island nations that see their nations disappearing under the water. <coughs> The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change does a wonderful job of reviewing the state of science, of climate science, from thousands of papers, perhaps 10,000 papers, <coughs> being reviewed in this latest review process. 
And I'm just drawing out one graph I happen to think is the most important graph in terms of political uh, um, input. This shows the temperature anomaly, the temperature rise compared with 1870 <coughs> as a function of the cumulative total anthropogenic man-made carbon dioxide emissions since 1870. And in black are what has actually happened. In red uh, is the projection forward on a business as usual scenario, which says if we go on accumulating carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we will see a temperature rise, the most likely temperature rise of 4.5 degrees centigrade. But note the band width of that projection, and you'll see that if we're unlucky, that could be up to six or seven degrees centigrade by the end of the century, which would frankly be disastrous for humanity. Now, what this sets out is the carbon budget required to stay at 1.5 degrees centigrade. All you have to do is run up the vertical axis to 1.5 and read across where we have to stop emitting. In blue, we show the behavior required if we're going to stay below 2 degrees centigrade, and you'll see that we have to uh, burn a, a, about as much carbon dioxide, create as much carbon dioxide again as we've already created. Uh, but the pathway we're on, let me emphasize, is a considerably larger pathway. So we need to have used up our carbon budget by 2100, therefore that's, sorry, by uh, the time we've burnt another half as much carbon dioxide again, and therefore we have a short timeline to decarbonize totally decarbonize the global economy. Uh, what, what does that mean in real terms? It means that we really have to accelerate the transition process. And if you look at the one and a half degrees centigrade, uh, you'll see that the, the objective there would be met by emitting about uh, uh, between a quarter and a half more uh, uh, carbon dioxide than we've already put into the atmosphere. That's going to be a very big challenge. And I'm just going to deal with that in the next two slides. This is, uh, I, I'm warning you now, this is my simple slide, the next one is more complicated. So this is, on the vertical scale, billions of tons per annum of carbon dioxide emitted around the world. And in red, I've used the IEA forecast. There's no better forecast than the IEA forecast. Um, and, and so in red, you'll see the pathway that we are on going forward in time. And in green, uh, roughly speaking, this is just a sketch, w the sort of pathway we need to be on. So we need to be passing through a maximum globally in emissions of carbon dioxide on a short-term basis, and then we need rapidly to fall in emissions totally. Now comes the complicated graph, so bear in mind this one. And what I'm now going to show you is the behavior if you integrate all of the nationally determined contributions from all nations and see what the emissions pathway looks like. And that's shown in the yellow uh, point curve. So the curve uh, uh, which shows the blue just below it is the behavior committed by governments uh, in Paris. And you'll see that if we follow that, it, it goes up till 2030. So there's a first disadvantage of the P Paris Agreement. Most countries have only committed to 2030. The United States not even quite that far. But if we add those up and then assume that we can accelerate the pathway but only after we achieve the, uh, 2030, you'll see that we've drawn in here, roughly speaking, a, a realistic pathway into the future. Now, what, what does that add up to in terms of temperature rise? Well, I, I'm afraid it adds up to a three to four degree centigrade temperature rise. Right, so now let's, let's go back and ask another question. If we look at the emissions per annum on the, uh, the curve that shows the sharpest fall, uh, uh, so that <coughs> by 2035, we've actually become greenhouse gas neutral on that curve. <coughs> that, uh, 
That's the curve required to stay below 1.5 degrees centigrade with a 50% chance. Now, in other words, from this analysis, we've got to be very lucky to stay below one point, uh, at anything close to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Uh, if you look at the blue dots and the red dots, those two curves represent two different evaluations of the fall required to stay below 2 degrees centigrade with a 50-50 chance. So somewhere uh, between the red, the blue, and the yellow curves is the pathway we need to be on if we are going to secure our future. Now, that, that's quite a big difference between those pathways and the pathway shown in yellow representing a simple adding up of the INDCs. But then let me emphasize, I believe we can do far better than those INDCs. The point about this pr my pr uh, presentation to you is, however, we will have to do much better and we will have to be very proactive in doing that. I won't, I won't keep you on this curve. It's, si it's simply telling you that I've been working on this problem for some time. Uh, the UK has been taking a series of actions, but what I would like to draw attention to is simply we, we uh, committed ourselves to reduce our emissions by 80% by, by 2050, and we made that commitment unilaterally in order to try and accelerate negotiations. And it's helped me in my bilateral negotiations country by country to be able to say, this is what we're doing, what will you do, rather than negotiating, if you do this, we'll do that. So that is written into our Parliamentary Act of Parliament, and that Act of Parliament was, po uh, was passed without any opposition from parties, and so it would take a two-thirds majority to change that. And we have carbon budgets going into the future. So it, Britain has already reduced its emission compared with 1990, the baseline of Kyoto, by 29%, and we will have reduced our emissions by 52% by 2028, which is when our latest carbon budget takes us to. I also want to point out uh, that we created our own international climate fund. We, we felt the Green Climate Fund that was set up uh, in Seoul was, was taking place too slowly. Our own international climate fund was, was initiated with uh, nearly four billion pounds, uh, and nearly six billion dollars, therefore, and, uh, sorry, more than that, and, and refinanced with a further six billion pounds in October 2015 in the run-up to Paris. This is the British <coughs> government's statement of our investment in the future by creating our own international climate fund with more than 10 billion pounds in it, compared with the Green Climate Fund's total of 10.2 billion dollars. Um, we have contributed 1.2 billion dollars to that fund. We do believe that the Funding across from developed to developing nations must take place, and this is our commitment to that process. Uh, this is simply to say I have been kept quite busy. I think I've made 80 official country visits in two and a half years, and uh, hopefully that's playing through. One of the other exercises we've conducted uh, was a risk assessment associated with climate change. The IPCC doesn't analyze climate risk as such, it simply says, if you emit this amount of greenhouse gases, this is the most likely outcome. <coughs> what we did here was engage with the insurance and reinsurance industry. Uh, we worked with four countries, Britain, uh, China, India, and the United States. About 120 uh, experts of science, experts in insurance. Uh, we had army generals, admirals, highly placed political advisors. Um, and the conclusion from this risk assessment was obtained by asking each country, for example, the Chinese government was asked, what is the worst that climate change ma may throw at you? And then we analyzed the probability of that happen, happening going forward in time. So, for example, the Chinese government said, all three rice crops fail in one year. We took a simplistic approach to that. If uh, rice flowering period experiences a temperature of above 36 degrees centigrade for two days, the plant doesn't yield any rice. 
And we use that as a basis for analyzing the risk. And the risk goes way beyond 1% with only a half a degree temperature rise above where we are now. Now, any country faced with a 1% risk of starving its people is going to be extremely concerned. But as we moved forward above 0.5 degrees, those risks became really quite appreciable. Now, we analyzed a whole series of risks. This is available on websites. And anyone who's got a strong, strong stomach, I would suggest, have a, have a look at this uh, analysis. It doesn't make comfortable reading because a 3 to 4 degree centigrade world is going to carry forward many, many of these risks to a very high percentage level. Now, here's uh, the rest of my talk, I'm going to be rather more optimistic. Uh, so <laughs> the, the new low carbon sector is emerging around the world. I'm quoting at the first line from the IEA. 2014, more renewable energy installed worldwide than fossil fuel based primary energy installations. We are already moving the ground towards our objective, in other words. We are not just starting in 2020. I give you the details for the United Kingdom because I think many people are rather surprised to see this. The fastest growing sector in our economy outside of the services sector is the new low carbon sector, the new clean energy sector. It's grown at 30% in the last three years. 11,500 companies employing over 460,000 people, and our turnover in 2013 was about 120 billion pounds. This is a very significant contributor to our economy already, and I believe the reason is because the United Kingdom started on this pathway early. But I think other countries in Europe would be able to show very similar uh, information. This is, in other words, what I'm saying is it's good for our economies as well as good for the climate systems. It's a critically important, important message. And this is a key factor, the falling cost for clean energy technologies. There should be no surprise to any economist to see that there's a sharp learning curve here. The fossil fuel industries are mature and therefore have stabilized at relatively low prices. Clean energy industries are not mature and prices are falling all the time. And we can expect these prices to continue falling going forward in time. <coughs> As prices fall, installation of these energy sources becomes very competitive with fossil fuel installation. But of course, we've got problems to deal with, in particular, intermittency. We need good interconnectivity, we need smart grids, and we need energy storage technologies to come through the system. Now, we'll, uh, you've already referred to this in your introduction. Can radical technological innovation reduce the cost of supply? Of course it can. We've always believed in science, technology, innovation, and wealth creation as our mode of existence. So we need to target our innovation support, and <coughs> a group of us in the United Kingdom began three years ago to push for a global Apollo program to combat climate change. And the objective was to p focus on all of the pillars and foundations of clean energy, which I'm showing here. Renewables, nuclear, carbon capture and storage being the primary energy sources. Carbon capture and storage would have to be 100% efficient in order to be able to use fossil fuels going forward. Otherwise, we rely on the first of these two. And then cross-cutting storage, transmission, and energy efficiency. We believe that all countries will be interested in collaborating in the areas indicated in white, and there will be other countries working in the other areas uh, of concern to them. Now, uh, the Global Apollo program became, it morphed into mission innovation in Paris. Uh, this was principally because Prime Minister Modi didn't like the reference to Apollo, uh, and he chose the title mission innovation. Um, <coughs> but also, some of you may have heard of David Attenborough, whose uh, films on the, uh, around the planet are quite well known. Uh, we managed to get David Attenborough involved in the Apollo program, and he was interviewed by President Obama on the subject. <coughs> and so in that interview, Obama committed himself uh, and the United States to joining the program. That was a key breakthrough. 
uh, <coughs> nations join the program by committing themselves to double their clean energy RD&D research, development, and demonstration by 2020, giving an annual spend which will rise to about $20 billion a year on this program. Uh, Bill Gates set up the Breakthrough Energy Coalition, which is essentially a, a venture capital fund. He put $1 billion of his own money on the table and said that's available to fund the new ideas that emerge and get them into the marketplace. And he's now got 26 billionaire friends, and together they've made this up to $20 billion. There's a, there's a guaranteed venture capital coming from billionaires around the world, so this is well shared, who are putting their money down over the next 10 years to see that we can spin this out into the private sector. Now, <coughs> I'm also hoping that large energy companies will join the program as well and join in the transition into this clean energy future. June the 2016 is the target date to get this rolled out because there's a clean energy ministerial in San Francisco on that date. And I think it's very important that we move quickly given the urgency of the problem. Now, I, I'm very much coming to the end of my program, but I'm going to just indicate the direction of travel. I think you've all heard that Prime Minister Modi has declared 100 gigawatts of new solar energy will be installed into the deserts in India by 2022. That's a very ambitious target figure. Um, China will be putting in more than that. Uh, but South Africa has just announced 9.6 gigawatts of solar capacity by 2030 to go into the Karoo Desert. People ask me, what, what sort of new ideas do you expect to come up in energy storage technology? This is my favorite that has come up. It's not a working technology. Uh, Professor Heindel in Germany came up with this uh, fairly recently. He's now been financed for a demonstrator project. What you see is an area of flat land where underneath the farmland is granite. Quite a common situation. Could be a desert where there's granite. And using standard mining techniques, Professor Heindel is a mining engineer, you mine out a cylinder of granite going down a diameter 150 meters, going down 250 meters. And under that cylinder of get granite, when you've got excess electricity, you pump water so that you pump the cylinder up out of the ground. And then when you want electricity, you use the mass of the granite to drive the water through a turbine to create electricity. So it's identical to up-pumped reservoirs that are currently used for, for storing uh, electricity. Uh, we've had these around for more than 100 years. Uh, but what this allows is that same technology to be used when there is no mountain. The, this is equivalent <coughs> to storing the water at about 2,000 meters above the uh, area where the turbines are because of the s simply the mass of the granite. Now, this is a clever idea, and the question is, is it going to work? That's the point of mission innovation, is to run all the way through to demonstration projects so that we can de-risk this for the private sector to take it out into the marketplace. And another idea, it allows me to say transport is another factor, one third of uh, global emissions from transport. How do, we, how do we manage air travel without burning any fossil fuel? Well, you're looking at an example here. Verilift is a British company. And this airship goes against the, the uh, normal mode of designing an airship. It's got an aluminum frame. Uh, but that aluminum frame has a very big advantage. Inside that frame are 12 helium bags, a helium cylinder, a compressor, and a crane. Underneath that, the aluminum frame, there's an area that can ca carry containers up to a mass of 1,500 tons. <coughs> if you load them on the ground, you can then lift it up into the air up to 30,000 feet simply by releasing helium into the helium bags. That's at zero cost of energy. 
Now you want to travel. So we've just picked up tomatoes from tomato fields in Spain, and we want to get them to the UK. That's where our tomatoes come from. Um, how do we get them there? Well, this is a very large vessel. It's 12 stories high. It measures 170 meters long by 80 meters wide. <coughs> it has a very large solar interception. It's covered with solar photovoltaics, and you simply drive the electric motors by solar energy. It can get up to 340 kilometers an hour, right? <laughs> carrying 1,500 tons of freight. So you deliver, how do you deliver to the depots of the supermarkets in the UK from the air? You simply lower the containers to the ground from the air. This is an air crane. In fact, you can lift the tomatoes up from uh, the air as well. You don't have to land this large machine anywhere. You can maintain it in the air as well and lower the pilots and his crew down uh, in a container as well. So these are ideas of, uh, that will take us into the future. I was taken up into northeastern Brazil to see their first major second generation biofuel plant. This is situated with, uh, in the middle of sugarcane fields. And we all know the Brazilians have been converting sugarcane into alcohol and using that to drive cars. This isn't converting the sugarcane. The sugarcane is farmed and converted into sugar. They convert the leafy material from the sugarcane. They bale it up and put it into this enormous uh, plant. Uh, that plant is entirely run by the product of the first stage. The byproduct is methane. And they burn methane to produce electricity to run the whole plant. There's no input of electricity to it. This is net negative CO2 emission fuel that is produced by this process. Simply suggesting that this transitional process that we're moving towards is already with us. I've published in Science Magazine early January, uh, uh, an editorial, and they gave me this headline, Biggest Opportunity of Our Age. And I leave you with that thought. Although this is a big threat, we can turn this into the single biggest opportunity of our time for creating clean air. That byproduct of shifting away from fossil fuel should not be ignored. By creating a safer future and also doing it at economic advantage. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sir David, for this uh, very comprehensive, very inspirational speech about Paris uh, and beyond. Now, I would like to open the uh, floor uh, for questions and comments uh, for uh, Sir David about uh, his speech uh, as well as his views uh, on climate change and uh, uh, beyond. So perhaps I can start with the uh, Netherlands, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, thank you, Fatih, and thanks, very many thanks to uh, Sir David, for a very, uh, very stimulating talk, uh, I have to say. My, my compliments. Uh, I hope we can also get the slides because there are some <laughs> fascinating ones that, we n that need n uh, more study. Um, let me just say, um, I mean, I, I very much like your, uh, your casting of uh, how we have moved on from Kyoto and that bottom-up is now much more important. And you gave, I think, very, very good examples of that. Um, on one of, your, one of your slides, you were talking about, you know, the big opportunity of falling cost, uh, particularly, of course, of renewable energy. Now, there was, there's another price that has been falling a lot lately, uh, which is the price of oil. And here's my question. Um, I can entirely see your point and your, your greatest opportunity. Uh, you're, you're completely right, of course. But in to what extent is our energy system still very much linked to also where prices of fossil fuels are going? So um, you're, you're, you're saying, you know, we are running out of time. 
So in what, in, to what extent are we slowed down by these kinds of uh, market volatility and particularly relatively low oil prices? I would very much like to hear your opinion on that. Thank you. Uh, Italy, please. Thank you very much, Executive Director. Thanks for organizing this most interesting uh, uh, talk. And it has been a privilege to listen to you, uh, Sir David. Uh, Italy believes that uh, we need to implement suitable, balanced, and efficient mechanisms, like putting a price on carbon in a harmonized way, to provide a solid contribution to long-term environmental goals while enhancing our economic cooperation. In this regard, a regional or multi-regional system could really help put us on the right pathway. You made a short reference to this uh, earlier, um, making, uh, after making reference to your visit to China, but I would like to know if you have a few more comments about, uh, about that. Thank you about uh, the, fa the fact that uh, a regional or multi-regional system could really help put us on the right path pathway or with regard to uh, putting a price on carbon in a harmonized way. Thank you. Uh, last question this round is uh, uh, Mr. Benesser, our Director for Technology. Thank you, Sir David, for an inspiring to uh, talk. I have a question about the sense of urgency and the cost of delayed action. We, I mean, it took several years from Copenhagen to Paris. Uh, the, the fear is that we need to accelerate. And the more we, we wait for the implementation, and the more it's going to cost. What are your thoughts about this cost of delayed action. Thank you very much, Kamal. Uh, David, can you, would you like to uh, answer these questions, your comments, and then we go for the second round. Uh, thank you to the Netherlands for, uh, for the tough question. Um, I, I've burnt my fingers publishing uh, papers on the price of oil, the volatility of oil prices, uh, we only have to think back to the year 2000 when oil prices were just above $15 a barrel. And up they went to $140, $145 a barrel, and now we're back down $30 and below. I, I, I don't think anyone's able to predict the, the future volatility of oil prices. However, the, the demand for oil has not risen as the oil prices have come down. And it's very important to try to understand why that is. I think, first of all, because many of us don't think that low oil prices are going to be there in three or four years' time. I think the, uh, the glut in oil production will come to an end, uh, and it's all just a matter of, of time scale. But oil price volatility is still going to be with us going forward in time. But the second thing is that already behavioral changes have, are, are in place, and I would suggest they're in place almost irreversibly. Uh, the arrival of uh, alternative cars, uh, uh, energy for cars, electricity in Europe in particular, hydrogen uh, fuel cell driven vehicles in Japan, the arrival of these alternatives are already showing distinct advantages. Um, I'm afraid to say that in London, uh, the pollution of our city due to the use of diesel fuel uh, cars has already passed the safe limits for the entire year. Uh, so what, what we are seeing is pollution from the use of, uh, of fossil fuel driven vehicles is a big problem. But if we think it's a big problem in Europe, it's an enormous problem in India and China and Malaysia and other parts of the world. So I, I think that people are already aware of the advantages of switching away from fossil fuel driven vehicles and it's really ground transport systems where oil holds sway. Um, I think th there is a, another issue which is that countries which import oil are learning that there are real advantages in cutting back the amount of money that goes into imported oil. 
And that also is an element of the irreversible shift away from oil. Uh, if there is a country deliberately overproducing oil, this could uh, turn out to be a rather dangerous game. I think I'll just leave that point there. Um, if, I, if I go on to the uh, Italian question, uh, uh, a, a very important one, the, can we move towards harmonization of, of carbon prices? Um, I think, first of all, the European Union is, of course, the single biggest carbon market in the world. It hasn't been working too well. Um, and we need to get our house in order. And, and we have a process, and I believe we are going to achieve that. And I would say that by 2020, we will have stabilized the European carbon market at a relatively good price. That in itself is going to be an advertisement to the rest of the world that it can be achievable uh, and that it can deliver. Um, the second thing is that the Chinese market rolling forward is going to be the single biggest market in the world. And so if our two markets come together, and I believe that is, has got to be a realistic uh, uh, future, then that is going to again pull in many other markets into, into place. There's no question that high carbon prices are going to accelerate the transition as we move forward in time, and we simply have to discuss what an appropriate price is <coughs> and what, what the public can accept as an appropriate price. Now, from the IEA, the question of the sense of urgency, I wish that this discussion was taking place 10 or 15 years ago. This, this is very, very late in the day. Uh, when I was Chief Scientific Advisor, I had to worry about impacts on the people of the British Isles that had a very low probability, perhaps 1% or less, but with a major outcome. Uh, I give you an example, and every country had to worry about this, was H5N1, which was an avian flu epidemic. Not many people died because it wasn't a person-to-person -person flu. But the concern was that it transitioned into such a flu. These zoonotic diseases, 80% of human diseases, come in this way. Now, the biologist told me that in 10 to tw 20 years, there was less than a 1% chance of this happening, but they didn't think it was much less than 1%. And the epidemiologists calculated that if this happened anywhere in the world, within three months, it would be in every country because of air travel. And three months after that, in the United Kingdom, between half a million and one million people will have died because none of us had protection against H5N1. So what was the consequence? Uh, we, we persuaded GlaxoSmithKline to produce a vaccine against H5N1 avian flu because once we had immunity against an H5N1, uh, we would see a fatality rate that would be far, far smaller. And we have uh, winter flu jabs in Britain and it's included in every winter flu jab. So now we are immunized in a way that removes that risk. So there's a low risk, a high expense outcome in dealing with it, but we managed to deal with it. Now, I, I fear with climate change that we're getting past the point of being able to manage that 1% chance. Uh, we really have to be quite lucky to avoid the worst outcomes. Uh, but most importantly, we must act quickly if we are going to avoid the worst possibility. Thank you very much, uh, David. So let's make a last round. Uh, Turkey, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Birol, for the opportunity to, uh, to listen to uh, Sir David. And, and, and thank you, Sir David, for a very encouraging and stimulating uh, presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your efforts towards the, this great success uh, uh, in COP21. Uh, we, we're here with, uh, uh, with enthusiasm uh, that uh, you will continue uh, to work towards, uh, <coughs> towards uh, a good implementation. Uh, and also, 
we are thankful to the United Kingdom, Sir David, for, for, for having been on the forefront uh, for so many years uh, in, in fighting climate change. I remember that we were invited many years ago by an NGO which was sponsored uh, or chaired by, by, by uh, the Prince of Wales uh, to London for a one-day meeting where we were told by your colleagues and, and friends uh, that uh, it's time to switch to low carbon economy uh, uh, while, uh, while the Chinese were commissioning uh, almost uh, 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 coal-fired power plants almost once a, w once a week. So we have achieved a great deal, but as you rightly said, we still have a lot to do. Uh, but uh, switching to a low carbon economy is the order of the day. And I hope that, uh, that we will be able to convince the international community that this is the only way uh, for, the, for, for our common good, for the common good. But we need probably more public support, Sir David. We need public support uh, and, and in order to uh, have uh, more public support, we need to enhance the awareness and maybe put more emphasis on the health aspect of this uh, uh, disaster. The people should be aware that, that it's, it's bad for their health and we should give examples and maybe use also the media. I was approached recently by a prominent Turkish businessman who asked me whether he should say yes to an offer by a foreign company to have a good share in a coal-fired power plant in Turkey. So he was asked to build, he's a, a, a prominent contractor, so he was uh, asked to build uh, this coal-fired power plant. I said, is it a good idea? My answer was, of course, clear. I said, maybe you should think long-term, it might be a very lucrative business now, but please do think twice because probably you should switch from coal-fired uh, uh, capacities to, uh, to renewable energy capacities. So I hope that he will listen to me. Mm -hmm. But this is, uh, th this is the situation and I, uh, I thank you very much once again for your uh, presentation. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Czech Republic, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you and uh, thank you for the great message uh, which we got uh, from you today and uh, uh, I understand that uh, we got in today's situation because of innovation and uh, uh, the only way how to get out of it is uh, again uh, via innovation. So I share your enthusiasm about the uh, new technologies and uh, new innovations and changes. But in the same uh, time, those innovations are mostly aimed at uh, renewable sources and we all talk about it uh, all the time. And I would like to uh, uh, draw our attention and know your view on uh, rather a traditional source, uh, and that's the nuclear power, uh, which um, uh, particularly in Europe uh, seems to be uh, uh, in a difficult situation. And I would like to thank to Fatih that uh, he devoted uh, part of the World Energy Outlook in the last edition uh, to nuclear power and uh, in a very fact-based uh, approach uh, brought uh, evidence on the table. And uh, uh, Sir David, uh, if you can share your view of the future of the nuclear power in our energy base in the future. Thank you. We have two last questions and then we have to uh, stop uh, there. Uh, Australia and uh, UK, uh, starting with Australia, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Executive Director, and, and welcome, Sir David, and thank you for that very uh, stimulating uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I would just ask uh, two things to, uh, I, if we could get your comments to reflect on. One is how you see the future in industrial development and expansion of emerging economies, um, particularly in the Southeast Asian region. It's an area that the IEA places a, a great deal of emphasis on, and uh, and. Uh, uh, within its um, world energy outlook. Um, and also some of the biggest gains for the planet uh, from the IEA work comes also from um, uh, greater efficiency um, in energy. Uh, if you could also reflect on that too. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, UK? Thank you, Sir David King. Very good presentation. Uh, my question builds a little on the Czech ambassador's question uh, regarding innovation. Um, it's my, my, my view is there is a very important 
role to be played by the breakthrough innovations that mission innovation will be looking forward, uh, trying to, to, to achieve. But also, uh, my question draws on the importance and relevance of the smaller innovators. So how to governments can bring these small innovators to, 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 uh, to the market and allow them to play a role. And I think this is a big issue in efficiency, for instance, uh, drawing new efficiency uh, for climate and energy and, and water that relates to, cli to climate as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, there is one uh, question also uh, uh, from the IE and then we perhaps uh, stop uh, there. Uh, you have a huge experience in the climate change and energy many, many years as a, a high-level government official, as a scientist uh, working at the universities, and you follow the IEA many, many years. If you would uh, leave us with a piece of advice for the IEA, what would you tell us? Perhaps. Uh, a brief note on that would be very much appreciated by uh, all the IEA colleagues here. And after that, uh, we finish the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, right, so I, I just um, can only agree with my uh, Turkish colleague. We, we need to emphasize the importance of health. Uh, um, you could even turn it upside down. The real benefit to China, to India, uh, to the Southeast Asia region is going to come from improvements in health as the air is cleaned up. Um, I, I don't want to describe climate change as the co-benefit of, of health concerns, but nevertheless, it may be pictured that way in many countries. And I think one reason why the Chinese Politburo is so focused on delivering a lower carbon energy uh, sector is precisely because of what the atmosphere is doing. We're seeing uh, lives being shortened in those countries that are suffering most in those cities by 15 to 20 years. It's just a phenomenal proportion of, of human lives that are lost through living in those atmospheres. Um, Innovation uh, is certainly an important way out of it, just responding to the Czech Republic, uh, uh, but really the question was about nuclear power. Um, <coughs> the United Kingdom <coughs> believes, uh, and, uh, and I'm, I suppose I'm the driver for this, we need every tool in the box in the battle against climate change. And for all reg regions of the world where nuclear power can be deemed to be a safe, safe installation, uh, this needs to be considered. Now, each country is going to have different views depending on public opinion as well. Um, in the British government, I was asked to go on television and radio very frequently when we came up to uh, our energy policy to meet that 80% reduction figure uh, that I, I quoted to you. I found it very difficult to see a pathway for the United Kingdom without relying on nuclear power. Not completely, but with some nuclear contribution. Uh, and it's, it's a very good power to have uh, when you've got intermittency from renewable energy to have a stable power source uh, for baseline energy production. Uh, and so my campaign with the media was to go on television and radio simply saying, we have this overriding need, which is to reduce our emissions globally, and therefore let's not discard this important uh, tool in the box. And if, if you asked the British population, this is back in 2003, two groups of the population, a different opinion poll question, are you in favor of a new nuclear bill? The answer came back 70% against. If you asked the question, Given the challenges of climate change, would you have nuclear new build as an element? The answer was 70% yes. So it depends critically how you ask the question of the public. Post Fukushima, I was on television very frequently explaining what had happened in Fukushima, what the damage to Japan was. We were very reassuring to the Japanese government 
by simply saying to our people in our embassy and to British people living in Tokyo, there is no need to panic. Stay in Tokyo. It is perfectly safe. There was a lot of uh, exaggeration, uh, and <coughs> I don't believe it can be said that a single life was lost due to radiation exposure in Japan, but a large number of lives were lost due to the event itself. So I, I think there was a lot of misunderstanding. It was interesting because before Fukushima, we were at about 65% of the public in favor of nuclear new build. After Fukushima, that dropped to 30%. And then six months after, with a campaign on the television and radio, it rose to 70% in favor. So it, it really does take a big effort to persuade the public to get information across. And I, I think science advisors really are an important tool to get that message across into the public domain. Now, <coughs> uh, innovation into the marketplace and the question, if I can just jump to the UK question. SME, small and medium-sized enterprises, are inevitably going to play a key role in the rollout. When, when we look at the United Kingdom's new clean energy sector, it's very heavily driven by small companies. And look at what it's doing to our economy. So we're not going to rely on, on large companies. What is uh, going to happen is that th that um, money coming from the Breakthrough Energy Coalition led by Bill Gates is heavily going to be used as venture capital for the small companies that will emerge from the process. My worry is that the large companies <coughs> are unable to move with the times. And what, what I am very keen to do is to create, alongside the Breakthrough Energy Coalition, a large company coalition, the energy companies in oil, coal, and gas, to come in and join us in this transition so that they transition their companies and actually survive as entities. So I'm not so worried about the SMEs. I'm, I'm more concerned about the big companies. Um, question from uh, Australia. I didn't emphasize the importance of e energy efficiency in my presentation, uh, and thank you for drawing attention to that. Energy efficiency is, of course, a win-win. Uh, and one of the elements of the uh, uh, lower demand for oil despite the price is that we've already driven through very much more efficient uh, automobiles onto the road, for example, than before. And people aren't likely to go backwards and ask for uh, big energy burners uh, to, to travel around the roads again. So this part of this is irreversible. The energy efficiency gain, a straightforward win-win. One of the uh, biggest successes in this transition is lighting, street lighting, uh, where the cost to, to cities has fallen dramatically as we've switched across to LEDs, lighting up our cities. And this is happening all around the world. It's happening in many homes as well. So thank you. It is critically important that we do that. And at the end of it, Patty asks me to give the IEA advice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think uh, uh, Fatty knows that I have an enormous respect for his organization, and I would be very, very happy to work behind closed doors with him on advice as he moves forward in time. But let me be clear, <coughs> the, the move towards defossilizing our economy has to be reflected in the way the IEA operates, and I'm sure it will be. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sir David. Uh, we could discuss much uh, longer uh, here, but we are almost uh, 15 minutes beyond our uh, time. Uh, Sir David, this was excellent. Uh, your views about uh, COP, about the uh, output results of COP and their likely implications, role of technology and the role that the uh, also, you mentioned the role of UK played in this very important uh, uh, sector. Now, uh, David highlighted the issue of technology several times, and it is the very reason IEA uh, decided a few months ago to move 
in the direction of the clean energy technologies and make the IEA the clean energy technology hub. And therefore, David, we will be uh, very happy to talk with you uh, behind the closed doors and also the open doors, to be honest with you, because our first policy is to opening the doors for the emerging uh, countries, and we are very happy to see the ambassador of uh, Indonesia here, the colleagues from also embassies from uh, Brazil, India, and uh, other uh, countries. So uh, we are uh, delighted with uh, David's uh, views. Uh, we get a lot of inspiration for our work. I is very keen to follow up uh, the uh, COP21 results, and important thing is not to get that results, but to implement those results, especially in the context of energy sector. So I would be very happy, dear colleagues, if you join me to thank uh, Sir David. David, you put it there, but for us it was a big opportunity to have you with us uh, here uh, today. And thank you very much, and we would like to see you very often in the IA. Thank you, David. So I would now like to invite you for a reception outside of this room. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, what a crowd.